But what does one know about oneself uh, that one wants to share with others? I wanted to share the truth as closely as I could uh, delineate it. Uh, that meant that I had to dig and dig and dig in much the same way, Taylor, that I worked on George Washington Williams. If George Washington Williams deserved 40 years of my life, uh, I should devote at least uh, 40 years of his life. I should at least devote three or four years of my life to me. And so I began to try to put together the story of my life in the way that Williams had put the story of, that I had put the story of Williams' life together. Now that was something rather difficult in view of the fact that I didn't save anything when I was young. I didn't save any records or anything. And here I am in 2000 or there about faced with the task of trying to get together the materials for the Franklin autobiography. I remember that I was uh, in the library once and I was shuffling around in the lobby and, and what remained of the card catalog after the, uh, after the advent of uh, the computers and all the rest. Someone walked up to me and said, to them, what are you working on? I said, I'm working on Franklin. Uh, and I was, and it was, a, it was a hard, it was a hard go to write the life of Franklin. But I would not do anything less for Franklin that I had done for Williams. I didn't have, I didn't think I had 40 more years. And so I had to accelerate things. And so I worked night and day and overtime, and thanks to the Library of Congress who provided me with a, with a senior fellowship, I was able to not only to work but to have a research assistant and to enjoy the facilities of, uh, of the greatest library in the world. Uh, and so I set out to reconstruct my life as best I could. Uh, but. What does one do about one's childhood when one didn't know much about one's childhood? And particularly since all of my siblings had long since departed this life, and uh, most of my friends, most of my young, young friends, my childhood friends, were gone. And I was lying in bed one morning and I decided that why shouldn't I do research by first looking up in the unpublished census schedules just what Rennesville, Oklahoma was like in 1915? Uh, some of you are probably not aware of the fact that that census that you see printed and on the shelves in the library is merely a summary of what really is in the paper, the census schedules. What I wanted was the unpublished census schedule, which, which told about the, the village, or any village, and which, as a matter of fact, provided information about the, its inhabitants, the ages, where they were born, how much property they owned, how many children they had, what the ages of the children were, and so on and so forth. So I, I decided that I would get the census schedules for 1920, the first that were available uh, for a person who, uh, was, uh, who, had, who was born in the decade earlier. And uh, the result was that I was able to sit down for my, you know, on my microfilm and read all about the village of Reddit Real where I was born. Uh, and uh, I, found, I was able to remember all those, to be reminded of all those playmates I had up and down the road. Uh, I didn't say street, there were no streets. Uh, and that road is now uh, euphemistically designated 
and ambition to designate as the John Hope Franklin Boulevard. But, uh, <laughs> in 1915, it was a road. Uh, and uh, it was barely a road, a dusty road. But then I found that uh, if I looked carefully at the census for 1920, uh, at Rennesville, I could find that all the playmates were listed there. Seville Jeffers, uh, Jesse Ferguson, uh, Elmer Robinson, and all the rest. And uh, they came back into my mind in a way with a vividness and a starkness and a, a clarity that I couldn't have imagined. Uh, there was also Mr. Bohannon. I used to read to Mr. Bohannon, who was blind, every afternoon, every Saturday afternoon, when I was eight and nine and ten years old. And uh, Mr. Bohannon apparently appreciated very much my reading to him. I would read the uh, newspaper, Black Dispatch from Oklahoma City and the Oklahoma Eagle from Tulsa and uh, various other newspapers. And he always asked me to read the Sunday school lesson. Now Mr. Bohanna did not go to Sunday school, but he wanted to be certain that I was <laughs> up on the Sunday school lesson. <laughs> So he, he sat there and listened to me read the Sunday school lesson. And obviously I hoped that I would be taking it in so that on Sunday morning I would uh, not be at the foot of the class, as it were. And so uh, in that way, I was able to reconstruct my childhood. Uh, the newspapers, which did not have my name in them, obviously, and the various magazines of the period gave me the flavor of the period and I was able uh, to fill in uh, the dots and uh, cross the T's and so forth and to work up uh, some factual data that served me in good state when I got ready to write. Then there were other things, the school records, which since I didn't keep school records for myself, I could get the school records from Brennanville and from Tulsa where I moved when I was 10 years old, and, the, uh, and various other records. Now my father, who was a lawyer, uh, was much better than I was in keeping the records. And so um, uh, he had, he kept a diary. Uh, and he also made many notes about events that were occurring from time to time. And uh, I was able to use my daddy's diary to write about my own childhood. Uh, as a matter of fact, he, he has this observation when uh, on the 2nd of January, 1915, he said that things are not going well. Uh, I'm, we are bound down in debt and there seems to be no relief. But he said on top of our poverty, and out of distress, we had a son on the 2nd of January, 1915. And uh, we put it, I wasn't certain whether that was the day of the joy or not. And so I, uh, I raised it with him later. He was so distressed that I discovered that observation in his diary. <laughs> and I had to rush and tell him that I knew he loved me and I loved him. And I know that was just his way of trying to express what actually was happening at that time. Uh, when I recall what uh, was done in those years to make my life uh, 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 somewhat uh, possible and easier. And when I recall the sacrifices that my mother and my father made, uh, it was easy for me uh, to, to grasp the conditions of life, even when they were not pleasant. 
and to tell in a way that I hope would be persuasive and convincing that that this this was a life uh, that was supported by not merely by my own parents but by the community in which I lived. Now I trudged through the sources uh, and sought to do exactly what I had done for Williams. Uh, I, I chased after Williams for 40 years on three continents and uh, although I didn't have to do that because that, that sounded like a dog trying to bite his own tail or something, I nevertheless uh, took seriously uh, the task of, of, of research and writing and in a way sought to do exactly for me what I had done for others. Uh, in, in, more, in the more recent years, I, it was not nearly as difficult for once I was able to uh, secure, secure positions, uh, tenured positions, and chairmanships of departments, I was able then to have uh, a kind of assistance to reserve the record of my life, not for me, but for the people who I was employed. So that when I was chairman of the history department at the City University of New York, Brooklyn College, I had two secretaries. And they were, they kept every record, not for me, but for the Board of Higher Education in the City of New York. So I could look over their shoulders and find out what they said about me, or find out what I said during the time that I was a tenured professor there. And I was able to get in that period of my life the kind of records that I couldn't have through. And so, with all of these records, I was able to put together a kind of faithful elimination of my life. Uh, there were also the, the, the great newspapers, like the New York Times. As I said, I wasn't in there. I got the impression if I gave something of a flavor of the that particular understanding of even of me. So that uh, when I was visiting the uh, institution that kept the president that preserved the record of the New York Times, they said, What would you like to know about this? I'd like to know what happened on the second of January 1915. And they gave me the issue of January 2nd, 1915. And it didn't have that I had been born on that day, but it did have. <laughs> it did have uh, a record of the war, uh, the, the bombing of, uh, of uh, the coast of, of France by Germany, and uh, the, the sinking of the Lusitania and other ships uh, in uh, the Atlantic, so that uh, I could give it the kind of flavor and atmosphere, even to. I heard it would make give it context. And so um, in that way I was able to uh, to dis describe not merely my own beginning but the but the condition of the country at the time in which the time that I was born. So that uh, I trudged through the period uh, both as uh, in my early days and in my later days and was able to put together the kind of, uh, of, of history of John Hope Franklin that I had done for George Washington Williams and that I think uh, anyone would want to do if one undertook to write uh, more than a memoir, uh, more than a few million little pieces, uh, and the context uh, would uh, enable one to write not only uh, elaborately and in some detail, but honestly as well. So that this is an uh, honest delineation of my uh, life uh, to the extent that I was able to uh, describe it. And uh, although you might, uh, if you read it, you might want to do some second guessing, I invite you to do that. Uh, but uh, I want to say that uh, uh, there's no 
memoir in it that cannot be substantiated and that uh, I have uh, honestly and diligently sought to share with my readers the precise experiences that I had. Now, uh, I want to say something about, about history as it relates to the uh, experiences of the human being. Um, I've been talking around the country about uh, history and the historian's role uh, as one seeks to describe the experiences of a people. And I have uh, come to the conclusion that it's, it's very important that all of us study and learn our history better than we uh, usually do. But I raise the question, for example, what do we really know about the revolutionary period uh, as, a, as an indication of, of, of one period that needs examination? Um, it's a period that is, it's a, it's a period that it's easy, quite easy, for us to distort. We can distort it with our patriotism. We can forget exactly what it was like. Uh, and we can shout and, and, and speak of Yankee Doo Dandy in a way that uh, obscures the experiences, the real experiences that we had. I, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. In 1900, in 1800, uh, the year 1800, uh, we uh, moved our capital from Washington, from, from New York City to Washington, D.C. And what was it like at that time? Uh, the founding fathers had written our Constitution a few years earlier, and they had placed in that Constitution some of the uh, principles that indeed repudiated uh, the uh, ideology that was uh, expressed and promoted uh, during the Revolutionary War itself. And by, 19, by 1800, uh, they were able to crystallize their thinking and to indicate that, as a matter of fact, they were not particularly uh, committed to the revolutionary ideology and they were much more committed to confirming the practices that were uh, sort of everyday uh, views and practicalities that they were pursuing. So that uh, when Thomas Jefferson was elected president in 1800, and they moved the capital from New York to Washington. Uh, he had the opportunity to move more in one way or another, either to reiterate and to clarify the doctrines that he had set forth in the Declaration of Independence, or he could be more realistic and more practical and try to preserve the sort of ideology that he set forth in the notes on Virginia. And there is a difference, but there are really honestly a difference. In the notes on Virginia, he said that uh, blacks could not think with any clarity, that they would uh, be confounded and confused whenever they sought to think about some weighty matter. 
and that they would even uh, go to sleep if they had to concentrate too long. And he said further that uh, they didn't smell well either. And then uh, that was a result, here comes the enlightenment scientific, that was a result of some peculiar conditions of their kidneys and their other innards that uh, threw off strange odors uh, at various times. It was this ideology that he had expressed with such Profoundness and such clarity and such certainty in, in 1782 that one finds cropping up in the legislation of 1800 uh, when he becomes president of the United States. Um, and it's legislated in such a way that it now becomes so real and so tangible and so revolting that it set back his Darker brothers from by many years. So that the legislation he signed in 1801 in the new capital in Washington, D.C. said among other things that black people were not to be eligible to vote. They could not hold office. This is the, this is for Washington D.C. The new capital just it's in its first days. That despite the fact that they had uh, he didn't say this, this and the legislation didn't say this. Despite the fact I'm saying that they helped to build the capital. Help to pave the streets, help to establish the stability of the city of Washington. They could not hold office, they could not vote, they could not even carry the mails. That's, that, that was the legislation signed by the President of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. Same man who wrote the Declaration of Independence. So this, this gives us some notion of what we should know about our history at the beginning of our nation. Do we really know the extent to which our founding fathers believed in democracy? And do we really know the extent to which they used the words merely to attract supporters who were not as class-bound or as committed to government by the few as they actually were? They were committed to government by the few and they were not interested in spreading democracy even around the world or around Virginia. Are we really familiar with the narrow view of mankind that was expressed by the founding fathers of the Congress in 1800 or in <laughs> later uh, legislation? Uh, and were we really familiar, are we really familiar with the things that went on even in the, in the later years. What about, say, the abolitionists? I am particularly touched by the fact that although Frederick Douglass was a leading and eloquent abolitionist, uh, 
even the abolitionists didn't want him speaking out quite so much and so vigorously. They said, cool it. You know. <laughs> he published his own newspaper. Why didn't he need a newspaper? We've got newspapers. But you know, I have, a, I have a point of view myself. I like to express. Oh, don't do that. Just you give us what you want to not tell, and we will fix it and tell the people what we think they should know.